नमस्कार एंड वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू आई एम रियली वेरी प्लीज टुडे टू बी इन तिरुवरिमल कॉलेज एंड टू पार्टिसिपेट इन दिस इवेंट अबाउट नॉर्थ ईस्ट इंडिया साउथ ईस्ट एशिया एंड जापान एज यू नो मे नॉट नो आई हैव माई सेल्फ स्पेंड Uh, a part of my career in southeast asia uh, so i speak and in japan so i speak uh, with uh, the uh, perspectives of living there or working on those relationship as well as i have some home insights which i'm sure would be uh, valuable to uh, to uh, figure out how we bond even more closely but i was very pleased when i saw the topic because it uh, it resonated with something which i have been trying to propagate as foreign minister and that is that in a globalized world foreign policy matters to everyone that what happens out there is no longer limited to out there and it is not only a subject which people like me need to worry about that in different ways it is something which uh, affects the life of an ordinary person sometimes you can't even know it and there are so many examples of that you know uh, if one looks back at the last few years even even the uh, the uh, covid pandemic is an example of how something which happened which started somewhere else in the world actually ended up frankly taking over our lives for more than 2 to 2 and a half years and in every you know every day something happens somewhere you know it could be it can be something very dramatic you know students or tourists who have gone abroad and find themselves in a conflict so that's happened in ukraine uh, people who went to work it happened to them in sudan Uh, it happened to people who were researchers in israel but it could be it could be the quality of your life you know uh, foreign policy for example make sure that your petrol prices are kept lower it ensures that the apple phone which many of you are probably holding in your hand or keeping in your pocket is made in india uh, there are you know depending on what you do in life uh somewhere or the other some part of what is happening in the world impinges on us and therefore i was very encouraged to see that that awareness when when uh the topic was you know how does northeast india really uh, uh interact uh, much more closely with southeast asia which is a proximate region uh, and with japan uh, that same awareness seemed to be there and is something which i very much welcome now uh in in looking at the subject i actually want you to reflect a little bit on history because we naturally assume that the situation that we are in uh you know that's like a starting point we don't think too much how did we uh, land up in that situation in the first place you know why are the challenges of the day the challenges and i want you to think back actually about the consequences of the partition now you would ask me saying okay what's the connection here you know we are talking northeast india and areas east of india and the answer is that actually the partition of india uh, in many ways broke or undermined a lot of the natural connectivity that the northeast of india had enjoyed and would have enjoyed otherwise and as a result of that actually if you look at the early years the first few decades of after our partition after we got independence the levels of growth that the northeast india should have seen we actually saw that stunt we saw that stunted because they did not enjoy all the advantages which many other parts of india had simply because 
as I said, these, these uh, you know, there were political barriers, there were, uh, there were administrative issues. Uh, and uh, therefore, in, in a way, uh, what we are seeing now is something which, quite honestly, should have come much earlier if history had been kinder to us. So when I look in terms of, you know, what has changed, to me, of course, step one, you know, uh, we speak about look east. I always tell people to, for India to look east, Delhi should first look east. Delhi should look east and see the northeast. And it is when the potential and the uh, and the uh, possibilities of the northeast are fully appreciated. That is actually when the look east and the act east policies become serious. The second, as I said, is to mitigate the the challenges which came out of the partition. And there, what had happened fortunately was that you know East Pakistan became Bangladesh. Then there was a difficult period even with Bangladesh. But if you look at the last decade, Northeast India has actually been a big beneficiary of this dramatic improvement in India-Bangladesh ties. That when we did the land boundary agreement in 2015, once things settled down, there was a new level of trust and confidence between India and Bangladesh. Uh, you saw a lot of other problems being resolved, particularly problems dealing with terrorism, problems dealing with instability. Because at the end of the day, until there is, you know, uh, stability, there is law and order, there is good governance, then other uh, benefits of, uh, of development and prosperity do not happen. So, what we have actually seen uh, uh, since 2015, has been initially a rebuilding of what uh, you can say was the pre-65. Because what happened in the 1965 was, in the 65 war, East Pakistan cut off all the connections which was then with the rest of India. So the rail links, the road links. Uh, so the initial challenge was, okay, get that back. So what we have seen really with Bangladesh is, road connectivity, rail connectivity, uh, the fact that today trains, buses take, uh, you know, move from this side to that side. The use of their ports, because, you know, those ports like uh, Mongla or uh, Chittagong, they would have been actually the natural ports with Northeast, if you look at it geographically. But those ports, for political reasons, uh, could not be accessed by us today when we look at the possibilities which have opened up for the Northeast, actually, uh, the, uh, the uh, enormous improvement in India-Bangladesh relations has actually opened up uh, many more uh, uh, opportunities there. The second natural, uh, uh, I would say, opening for us is, of course, Myanmar. Now, in the case of Myanmar, we have done our best uh, and uh, again, there are projects there which could be game-changing. Uh, probably the most important one among them is what is called the India-Myanmar-Thailand Trilateral Highway. If the trilateral, or I would say when the trilateral highway is built, because parts of it have been built, there are gaps which are missing today. When the trilateral highway is complete, actually there is, for the first time, the possibility of smooth logistics movement all the way from, I would say, India till actually the Vietnam coast. Because on that side, the roads are growing, the connectivity is happening. So if we can somehow get through the Myanmar challenge, uh, the, the possibility actually of a connectivity corridor which will run down the, you know, the lateral of Southeast Asia coming all the way actually uh, into the Indian heartland. Uh, that is something which would happen. Uh, Myanmar, as I said, has been a great challenge. Uh, uh, till uh, there was a restoration of democracy, we had one set of problems. Last few years, uh, after uh, the military has taken over, there's been, uh, in fact, uh, a new set of problems, in many ways more serious, 
Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, today for us, uh, while we are also mitigating its consequences on our own border, uh, there is the uh, larger stakes that we have uh, about connectivity through Myanmar. If all of this works, think about it, you know. Once the Northeast gets connectivity eastwards through Myanmar, southwards into Bangladesh, the entire eastern India, including the eastern seaboard of India, is developed more intensively, which is definitely the objective of the Modi government. There is, actually we are looking at the possibility today, I mean, on the horizon, there is a, a, a completely new promise uh, of a much brighter economic future. Uh, for Northeast Asia, uh, for Northeast India. Now, uh, the connection with Southeast Asia was one subject. The other one, of course, was the links with Japan. Uh, I, I think it was rightly mentioned that Japan has taken a special interest in Northeast uh, uh, India. And realizing that, uh, in fact, in 2017, Prime Minister Modi asked us to set up a special forum uh, with Japan. It's the only forum of the kind we have with any country. It is an India-Japan forum which is dedicated to developing India's Northeast and developing the, the links of India's Northeast with other international uh, players. So basically it means Bangladesh and, and Myanmar. Uh, this started in 2017, it's now seven years. Uh, as Foreign Secretary, I chaired it uh, myself. Uh, and if one looks at these last seven years, uh, the, some results of this are already uh, evident. I think probably the biggest difference it has made is in national highway uh, connectivity. Uh, that uh, in partnership with Japan, actually there's been uh, a significant enhancement of road building. Uh, I think uh, those of you from the region would know this better. I'm told National Highway 54, 51, 40, 127B and 208 are examples uh, really of uh, work which has been done or work uh, which is underway. Uh, but beyond physical connectivity, uh, there are places, I mean Guwahati is one example, uh, where the uh, water, uh, the water distribution in Guwahati, the uh, the sewage uh, system, uh, that is uh, under under uh, modernization. Uh, there have been places where uh, power power stations have been upgraded. Uh, in Mizoram, uh, there's a commitment to build a, a specialized cancer center, a cancer treatment center for the northeast region because. That's a particular concern there. Uh, and in many of the northeastern states, actually, the bamboo value chain uh, is uh, being, being uh, improved. Uh, we also hope to see uh, uh, an expansion of language, Japanese language teaching in many of the educational institutions uh, there. So these are actually developments on the ground that I'm talking to you about. So what Beyond that, you know, what is it, in what way can really the no uh, Northeast uh, integrate or interact uh, much more with the regions uh, east of it? I would say probably today the strongest possibility is in mobility, in the movement of skills and talent. Because to in some cases in Southeast Asia, but definitely uh, in Japan, there is actually an enormous shortage of skills and talent. So uh, we have uh, uh, worked out with Japan an agreement in 14 different areas where if people uh, go through a basic language course uh, and uh, clear the, the minimum uh, you know, requirement for it, uh, they then become eligible really for uh, employment uh, uh, in Japan. Now, similar, uh, uh, you know, arrangements today, uh, what we call mobility agreements. Uh, it already existed with Singapore, where language is not an issue. Uh, we are actually discussing one with Malaysia uh, right now. Uh, the Another country which is very keen 
uh, to look at Indian talent is Korea. Uh, and uh, much of it is, you know, in, in, you can say, more traditional areas of employment. But there is now something very different emerging in the global economy, uh, which will be of great interest to all of us, and that is semiconductors. And it's of interest to us also because when uh, we have, you know, the Modi government has a semiconductor mission. And the first few agreements uh, between companies for the semiconductor mission have already been signed. And work is actually happening today, groundbreaking is happening, uh, you know, uh, facilities are coming up. And uh, we were very, uh, you know, gratified that one of them, a very important one, happens to be in Assam. That in Assam for semiconductor technology, uh, for uh, assembly testing, uh, marking and packaging plant to come up. This is actually when we say first Delhi should look east and act east and look at northeast Asia. One thing is to pay lip service. The other is actually to put let investments on the ground out there to see that uh, there are actually employment opportunities locally of a of a high 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 skill of something which is at a global level and. Something like semiconductors, which is seen very much as a sunrise industry. For that to come up in Assam, which has a larger repercussion for the entire Northeast Asia, uh, Northeast India, is something which is very important. So, when we look today at, uh, uh, at uh, East of India, uh, as I said, definitely uh, Japan important, Southeast Asia important. Another player important is actually Taiwan that with Taiwan, Taiwan is a partner in one in the first, uh, in this uh, fab, in the foundry, semiconductor foundry, which uh, we have uh, agreed to. But again, with uh, Taiwan, we have also done an agreement on mobility. Their parliament equivalent is now uh, considering it right now. So here again are possibilities uh, of, uh, 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 of uh, a workplace uh, out there. Now, other than that, a second area of great interest is actually tourism. That uh, there are, you know, we are today a country with an enormous potential, which is still vastly unrealized. That if one looks, if you just look at even a simple exercise like how many world heritage sites there are in India, and then see how many tourists there are, and you can see that, you know, there's a lot of ground that we need to make up. And part of the reason why we actually organized the G20 presidency uh, for a full year across the entire country, because Mr. Modi's instructions were, he said, I don't want a single state left out. I don't want, you know, this is probably the biggest thing that we have done in terms of getting the diplomatic attention of the world. But that diplomatic attention should not just be in Delhi and three or four other metropolitan cities. It should not even be in the normal tourist destination, okay, go to Agra, go to Jaipur, go to Bharatpur. It has to be in every state. And we ensure that it was in every state. And by doing it in every state, we actually, because if you look at the G20, roughly, I think about 100,000 foreigners came in some form or the other for the G20 meetings. Okay. And think of them actually as probably the most important influencers of the world. But if these people went to different states of India, and many of them, you know, didn't even know the state existed, that for them to go there to see something very different, it, you know, the, the Common feedback I used to get is we saw an India beyond the India that we knew. And that was actually what was our objective. So what we hope very much is in the coming years, the all the effort that we put in through the G20, that was like almost like the basic foundation. Today we do intend to have tourism promotion actually as a core economic activity. Because if you look today in the world, nothing employs people at tourism. You know, the multipliers are just enormous. For 
for every tourist who comes in the number if you look at the chain of you know employment consequences that it poses it's it's actually uh, something which can be game changing and that is certainly something we uh, intend to promote uh, in the northeast uh, the third of course is the in a sense the more orthodox uh, areas of employment and i would particularly single out uh, health hospitality and aviation and it's interesting uh, you know uh, one of course uh, not all countries in the world are doing economic uh, well economically but even among those who are we are a little bit unusual to we are one of the few countries where the planes are full the airports are full the hotels are full uh, that you know when you have a, a 7% growth rate in the size of the population and the size of the economy that we have uh, the the effect that it has on uh, sectors as i said like uh, hospitality aviation tourism is enormous and where health is concerned it's also a reality after covid all of us actually have become much more health focused and on top of it the government itself through the ayushman bharat initiative is trying to get everybody to understand that health is not a privilege health is a right that we have to create you know if we are talking of a vikshit bharat the starting point is to make sure everybody has at least basic health access affordable health access and if there is affordable health access just imagine what the consequences for the health industry is going to be so i put it to you that these you know there are the sunrise industries there are the there is the tourism potential there are the more orthodox sectors health hospitality uh, aviation and as i said you know all of these are not just in the country uh, it is also actually a uh, part of being uh, captured by the global workforce so the 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 picture that i present to you is a northeast which is at, actually today getting the political and economic and development attention that it has long lacked and with that attention and with those resources with better governance with greater political stability and with connectivity to the world and with the special you know interest which countries like uh, japan or uh, you know uh, southeast asia would take we are actually look we are at the cusp of something really quite different now this was the immediate topic which was given to me but i can't resist the temptation of widening this bit because just as i spoke to you about the northeast and the you know the proximate areas and the areas with which there would be a stronger cultural historical connect every part of india actually has some variant of it that if you look at say peninsular india you know they would also be looking at southeast asia they would be looking at indian ocean states even you know uh, a state like odisha odisha has a bali yatra you know they have a historical connect actually with parts of indonesia you go to kerala everybody will talk to you about the gulf you know go to gujarat they will talk to you about east africa so the fact is every part of india in some way or the other actually has some external connection there is one some special affinity there and if we are smart we need to maximize it. that in every relationship we need to find okay which part of india which face of india which you know which uh, talent of india where is the a, a intuitive connect strong and if we do that actually in a integrated mapped out manner i can tell you my job in the foreign ministry will become much easier that everywhere i would find some kind of connect between india and some part of the world 
uh, around us. Now, how to maximize the bonding, of course, uh, is, is uh, uh, a very important part of our policy. And the way, you know, uh, uh, in terms of uh, definitely the Indo-Pacific, the region east of India today, or if you look towards the Gulf, you look towards Indian Ocean, we have to also make history work for us. Because we have history. Okay. If you start traveling eastwards, even from Delhi, start going eastwards, you can see actually some Indian footprint, which actually goes all the way to the east coast of China, even up to Korea. Okay. There, there are, uh, you know, there is a, uh, you can call it a legend or history, but there is certainly a belief in Korea that they have a connection with Ayodhya. Uh, if you go to the east coast of China, uh, there are actually Shaivite temples, uh, which uh, there's a, a town there called Chwanjo, uh, where even today there are Shaivite temples because they were uh, trading communities. In the middle of Vietnam, uh, those of you who may be familiar with those Jaishankar Prasad stories of Champa Kingdom, that, you know, we somewhere, maybe the colonial era, maybe our I don't want to blame you, but education system, you know, somewhere we actually have lost our own sense of history. And it is important today to, to recover that, to realize it, to appreciate it. Because once we get much more into our authentic history, uh, rather than what we have inherited or shaped by others, I think many of these connects will naturally, I mean, there is such a deep connect between Northeast India and Southeast Asia. But it's not something which is necessarily taught to us in our school and, and college. And I can give you the same the other way. If you look towards West of India, if you look at the Gulf, you look at East Africa. I mean, these are regions where, you know, for centuries, for millions, actually, in some form or the other, India and Indians uh, have been active. So, recapturing that sense of history is important. Then what happens is if you really want to matter in the world, you have to find commonalities. I spoke about that. But you also have to be relevant today to what the world wants. And you have to earn the respect of the world. So when I was encouraged to make some remarks on my book, you know, a large part of my case about why Bharat matters today, one part is this affinity that we have with the world. That with a very large part of the world, there is some connect, something in our history, something in our culture, you know, something in our tradition that I can find a bonding. If I am aware and I play it up and I, you know, make them aware of it, I think for them Bharat will matter. Secondly, if I am more relevant, to the world. Now, I can be relevant in different ways. I can be relevant economically. I, I was relevant, I was very relevant during COVID because I was for many, for a hundred countries a provider of access. So, I, I am relevant today because in the Red Sea, you know, with all this tension which is taking place between, uh, you know, people firing missiles and drones and piracy, 21 of our ships are actually on service out there who are actually protecting international ship. So that's also a very graphic, and they, they actually keep trade costs down. Because if you can protect shipping, insurance cost is less, shipping cost is less. So how do you get relevant? And of course, uh, uh, most important, how do you actually get the respect of the world? And you get the respect of the world just like you get the respect of people, which is you have to perform better. That any of us who, you know, a student gets respect when a student, you know, in the eyes of the teacher or in the eyes of the peer group or the eyes of the college. If the student does well, if the student delivers or exceeds expectations, I think you get respect. So how we do at home is not just a matter for us at home. We are the largest country in the world. 
we are the fifth largest economy, soon will be the third. How we do at home is watched by everybody abroad. What decisions we make at home is also very keenly followed by the world. So, if we are now, in the coming weeks, going to decide our future, in whatever way we wish, it's not just a conversation amongst ourselves. It's a conversation or a discussion in which the other uh, six billion people are also uh, tuned in. So, these are all actually aspects of why Bharat matters. But I do want to share with you, as someone who uh, travels uh, a fair amount, what is actually our global connection. Because when we say why Bharat matters, at the you know at the end of the day, countries matter because there is a perception, there is a branding uh, which has been created. I, from my own travel experiences thought of six or seven really key points today. When you, any of you go abroad or you meet someone from abroad, these are actually their perceptions of India. One, I would say the dominant one is that this was a country which handled the COVID challenge exceptionally well. It started out as the country of the greatest concern. It ended up as the source of the greatest support. And not just handled the COVID, they actually took uh, the right decisions which enabled us today to become the fastest growing economy, large economy of the world. Because do remember, a lot of countries today have still not recovered from the COVID. That their economic performance even today is, is still shaped very much by the shock and damage that they suffered uh, during COVID. The second is the manner in which we secure our citizens of God. Believe me, that has got everybody's attention in the world. You know, a lot of us, rightly, are very proud of how, I'll give you an example of how we got our students out of Ukraine in Operation Ganga. As I said, rightly so. But I also want you to know that there were many countries who actually told their students and their citizens, saying, sorry guys, there's nothing I can do. You now have to figure out your own way out. And these were not developing countries. They were even developed countries who actually told their people, you are on your own. So this change which has come up, that any Indian traveling anywhere has that sense that, look, you know, uh, there's, sometimes people talk about, a, you know, there's something called a passport index. Uh, and the, the passport index basically is based on how many places you don't need a visa for. To me, there's something missing in that index. I would have put, which passport are you carrying and who will come for you when you are in trouble? And believe me, if you put that factor in, you will get a very different uh, passport uh, index out there. Not getting a visa and having a f ability to travel easily is just one part. What happens when something goes wrong? Who will look after you? Who has a system which is ready to back you up when you go out? To me, that's the real value of the passport. And if the Indian va passport today is looked at with greater respect, as I said, one part of it is what we do at home. But the other is also that people know that this passport means that their government stands behind the person who is carrying the passport. The third is our performance at home. Uh, and, you know, I, I often share with my own colleagues in the cabinet and in the parliament that they think that when the foreign minister goes out of India, all the time you discuss foreign policy. Makes sense. But in reality, actually people abroad are enormously fascinated by what we are doing at home in our in the rest of our lives. You know, they want to know how does your ration system work, how does your election system work, you know, how you're getting your gas cylinder, how you're getting your electricity connection. Why is it that it has changed? Because they've read all these stories. That 
when they look, you know, I we are speaking about Japan. Let me give you a number related to Japan. In the last 10 years, we have built 40 million houses and given it to people who are eligible in view of their low income. At 4.8 a family, which is the average number in India, that means about 190 million people have got houses in the last 10 years. That's one and a half times the population of Japan. Now, when you tell somebody in Japan, you know, guess what? I'm, I'm actually housing one and a half times your size in the last 10 years. They then actually get the scale of, of what, is, what is happening uh, in this country. Then there is, of course, the infrastructure progress. I think we all live in this country. We can see it every day in different ways. But probably much more fascinating to the world is actually those technology feats that we do. You know, going to China, you know, uh, I, I would say in the last 10 years, probably the most impactful thing we have done other than COVID management was going to the moon. The Chandrayaan-3 mission, you know, has had a huge impact on the perception of Indians uh, abroad. And finally, as I said, a lot of it is about actually a country which has the ability to stand up for itself, for its interests, for its citizens, stand up to pressure. And, and in a sense, uh, uh, you know, radiate its own persona uh, and its culture. So, uh, let me conclude with this. I'm very confident today that given the focus uh, in the government on the Northeast, given the resources that are there, given the larger stable environment uh, which we have produced, and I accept that there are challenges coming out of Myanmar which are exceptional, but I think we can handle those. Given the fact today that we are globalizing and we are creating a pathway by which our talent and skill at home has access to a global workplace, given the fact that there is enormous interest in the world in investing in India, in knowing in India, traveling in India, I see a lot of possibilities out here. Once again, I'm really very thankful that you have given me an opportunity today of sharing uh, some of my uh, views with you. Uh, I don't. I, I think if there's time, you'd like me to respond to uh, something. You know, we can we can open it up. Can I do it from there? Sure. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll do these three. And, uh, yes. Yeah, okay. You know, uh, the first question about uh, border policing and connectivity. Look, uh, I think every country has a right to ensure that its borders are protected. That uh, you know, uh, that uh, any migration that takes place is legal and it is regulated. This is the right of a state. This is an obligation of a state. It is a sad truth that we have failed for many years in this. I believe that the last decade has been different. I promise you the next decade will be different. Now, uh, we sometimes, you know, uh, make the error of uh, rationalizing uh, neglect uh, or lack of competence as some kind of virtue. It is not. Uh, so I think there's a very clear consciousness today, both in the central government as well as in all the governments of the Northeast, that managing the border, securing the border is very important. Now, securing the border doesn't mean cutting off connectivity. In fact, on the contrary, 
if there is no connectivity, then people will come through various means. It is only when there is connectivity that you have created a pathway and then you regulate the path. So, for me, actually, it's not an either or. Securing the border and creating connectivity are part of a package. Neglecting the border and allowing uncontrolled migration is another package. Each one, as you know, has its, forgive my saying it, a political outlook and a certain history. I believe today that we are in the right outlook and the right history and therefore the, and reflected in the right policies. On the soft, uh, soft power uh, issue, yes, you know, look, people, uh, all of us sometimes underestimate how uh, human diplomacy and foreign policies. That at the end of the day, people connect with each other. You know, there is a chemistry. Uh, you, uh, you, it, you know, it's like a, look, the world is a society, like we are a society. If you get along with somebody, you are more likely to do things for them. It's human. So, it applies to nations as well. So, I actually believe today, the more uh, we can promote the facets of India, the branding of India, uh, which will appeal to partners abroad, the better are our chances of success. If somebody in in uh, you know Japan, since you mentioned cherry blossom, if somebody in Japan connects intuitively to Meghalaya because of this, and that then you know biases them in favor of doing things, or if nothing else, coming as tourists and bringing the country, I'd say uh, so much the better. In fact, that's why I said every part of India has some propensity somewhere. We need to maximize that. And definitely, you know, I, I believe me, on this I'm a personal authority. You know, I know exactly what appeals to people in Japan. <laughs> so and there is a there is a emotional, cultural connect with the Northeast. I, I think it's something which we should we should uh, take further. Uh, on the enterprises and jobs. I I have a different view because I think you could pick uh, something like a resource a resource uh, industry and say, well, the benefits of the resources did not come to people of that state. Possible to make that argument. But to me today, the you know the issue is not so much how do the profits come. The profits will come. That's not the issue. The issue is how do you create employment in that state? How do you create opportunity for people of that region or that state to get a fair share of what is uh, a national growth? If the industries of India, if the new enterprises of India are all outside the Northeast, you are automatically putting people in Northeast at a disadvantage because you have to go somewhere else. You know, it's, it's not a level playing field for them. So, we certainly in the government believe today that there must be a conscious effort today. If something is happening in some other part of India, why doesn't that also happen in the North? And that has not been the thinking in the past. As I said, Delhi didn't think at least. That is what has changed under Modi. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a simple thing. In this cabinet, I mean, we are finishing our five years. There's not a single minister who's not gone to a northeast. I mean, that's how it begins. So that has actually today created a totally different level of commitment there. And again, uh, I would say I take satisfaction that the cutting edge industries, you know, if you look, if someone says, okay, what will India's future be? To me, the future will be uh, semiconductors, it will be electric mobility, it will be space industry, it will be drones, it will be clean tech, it will be renewables. I would like the sunrise industries to be in the northeast as well. And that's really the kind of approach that we are pushing uh, very strong. I'll take one more. Uh, 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 uh,
happens sometimes bad time relationships. Because we will be the poorest. And in the speech, you also mentioned about India and Bangladesh's partnership in related portability, related uh, portability. In this slide, how feasible do you think trilateral partnerships with India, Japan, and Bangladesh can be so that regional connectivity with the North East can be further advanced? No, I'll take three. I'll take a set of three. I'm from the state of Sikkim. So my question is something related to your community's culture. The North East in the past uh, has had issues with the needs of reservation uh, of jobs for the locals. In the globalized world, uh, which you mentioned earlier, uh, but in FDIs and specialized jobs uh, are an integral part of uh, any partnership. How does one ensure that uh, an equilibrium is created and achieved between bringing specialists from uh, around the country and outside and also providing job opportunities for the locals uh, in the employment sector? Go on. Uh, my name is Thagas. I am also from Assam. So my question is, in recent years, uh, the current government has made special emphasis on creating new economic centers. This, this looks like Gip City in Gujarat and uh, even special progress in, uh, in Gujarat. So do you see such similar cities coming up in the northeast as well? Because in your speech as well, you did focus on Guwahati getting semiconductor facilities and others. Uh, you know, uh, that's an interesting proposition in India, Japan, uh, Bangladesh, bilateral, because uh, what is actually happening now in the world is, uh, as you all know, the United Nations is not working too well. Uh, and uh, the old era when, you know, there were camps and alliance groups, that's also kind of no longer the case. So in reality, uh, a cluster of countries uh, who have a similar interest meet up and say, okay, three, four of us, five of us, we will work on this issue. So uh, in different regions, on different subjects, uh, different combinations of countries have come together. We ourselves, for example, with Japan, have a trilateral one with Australia. Uh, we had one with the US, but that's kind of got superseded by the Quad. Uh, so, uh, the, the passion you can say today is towards uh, these kinds of trilateral type arrangements because these are very practical way of, of getting something done. It is a fact that uh, the Bangladesh as a country and the current government in Bangladesh has very positive good relations with Japan. So, I think uh, our, our thinking would be very much in sync uh, with each other. So, it's certainly uh, food for thought. If it ever happens, you are welcome to take the credit. <laughs> uh, on the, uh, uh, the question you asked, I mean, you know, you know, what you're really asking me in a way is a kind of a, a fair access, uh, a fair opportunity of employment. How, how does one how does one uh, create I, I feel there are uh, two parallel processes at work one is my direct responsibility but one as a citizen as a minister as a politician also I'm very deeply interested in the one which is my direct responsibility is really how do I ensure when there is a global demand, that our citizens get a fair shot at it. Not just get a fair shot at it, get the, you know, the right terms, the protection, the, the respect, which goes uh, with that. You, know, you don't want them to go and work at lesser terms than the people, people of that. Uh, and that's a very big subject today in foreign policy, that we are looking at uh, you know, these mobility agreements with different countries. And the bottom line is, allow our citizens to access your markets. Normally they'll put some number, but often the numbers are in real life exceeded because the demand is very great. Uh, but ensure that they get the same protection, they get the same 
benefits and privileges that you would give to your own citizens. And we've, in recent times, done agreements like this with uh, Japan, with Australia, with Germany, with Italy, uh, Austria, uh, UK, uh, France. And I see this actually uh, growing. Uh, the second part of it is within the country. Uh, you know, how do you ensure that, uh, you know, the youth of the Northeast has a fair shot at national uh, employment uh, opportunities? You know, uh, and there again, I, I would say one answer to that is actually by investing more deeply in the Northeast assets. That, you know, the more educational institutions, because that leads to the last question, the more educational institutions which come up there and, you know, the more uh, business investments that there are there, there's then a natural, you know, I would say ecosystem of capability and the creativity uh, uh, which, is, which is built up. So my answer to your uh, question, uh, you mentioned some, you know, what is happening in some other uh, uh, states. I, I, I think it's something which needs to be thought about. But my gut sense is, uh, so, you know, whatever we do in Northeast has to be suited to the uh, to the circumstances of the Northeast. You know, it's not like something works in Gujarat. Let us try a replication of that. It may not fit. You know, it may not be the priority. It may not be the same. But definitely, I think what you have seen in the last ten years. You know, first of all, by improving the infrastructure of the North by connecting the Northeast, by creating better skill talent opportunities out there. I would definitely say we need to make a big push for uh, business because finally, who's a job creator? Business is the job creator. You know, government is also a creator, but the government is not a primary creator of jobs. It's the business which is the primary creator of jobs. And that is something uh, I would say uh, we would see very much uh, as... as uh, uh, a priority uh, in the communities.